All right, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Um, as we saw last time, there are multitudes of people, thousands upon thousands of people from all over the place that were bringing their sick, their um, diseased, their paralyzed, their demon-possessed, tormented friends and neighbors to Jesus. And all it says was, and he healed them. He was demonstrating the kingdom of heaven was at hand. He is the king. Wherever the king is, that's where the kingdom is. The kingdom of heaven is spiritual right now because whoever is coming into the body of Christ, whoever becomes a member of his kingdom, um, the kingdom of heaven is here spiritually. But the kingdom of heaven is coming literally when Christ returns at his second coming. He's going to establish his kingdom. It's going to be a rule and reign for 1,000 years, and we'll be ruling and reigning with him. As we saw at the beginning of chapter 5, because of the multitudes of people, Jesus goes up in a mountain that overlooks the Sea of Galilee. Some refer to this as the Mount of Beatitudes. And he will then give them what we call the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6, and 7. This is basically an outline of the way Jesus expects his disciples to live in this fallen world. And as I mentioned last week, this, uh, the theme of this is true righteousness. Now this is in opposition to the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders in Israel, because they had an outward form of righteousness based on their self-righteousness, their own efforts, their own good works, and yet they had an outward appearance of holiness, yet their hearts were far from God. So Jesus teaches his disciples what true righteousness looks like, that true righteousness begins in our hearts, and it begins in our hearts when Jesus imputes to us or gives us his very own righteousness. As we'll also see, nobody can live up to the standards that he lays out for us in the Sermon on the Mount any more than anybody can live up to the Ten Commandments, which is God's perfect standard of righteousness. And we'll be very, uh, Jesus will be very clear about this. This is why Jesus started off his message there in uh, chapter 5, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Again, as we saw last time, this sets the tone for the rest of this message. In other words, Jesus wants us to do an honest evaluation of our spiritual condition. In other words, the person who is poor in spirit recognizes that they need God's intervention. They need God's help. They need God's, you know, God to rescue them. We come to the conclusion as we go through the Sermon on the Mount that God is holy, that God is perfect, that we are sinful, we are imperfect, we are unholy, and we need Jesus for salvation. And once a person has that understanding, then you realize that Christ has done everything for our salvation, and all we can do is place our faith and trust in Him alone. And when we do, He gives us that free gift of everlasting life. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. There's no way you can do enough good deeds to merit salvation or earn heaven. So as we come into verse 13 this morning, we are given a couple of descriptions of who we now are because we are in Christ. Verse 13 says, notice you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now, when Jesus says you're the salt of the earth, he uses the emphatic, which simply means when he says that, he's saying you alone, my disciples, you alone are the salt of the earth. As many of you know, salt was incredibly important in their culture at that time. First and foremost, salt was a preservative. Sometimes they would dry their meat and, and fish, but oftentimes when they'd have a fresh catch, they would pack it in salt. That would keep it from putrefying. That would keep bacteria from taking over that meat. Um, sometimes salt was used as an antiseptic. If somebody got cut or wounded, they would put salt on it. Ouch! Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> it stings, but it works because it's killing the bacteria, it prevents it from growing. Sometimes salt was used as a um, seasoning on food for many, many years. That's what it's been used for. It enhances the flavor uh, of many foods. And at the same time, salt makes you thirsty. You know, whenever Elizabeth and I go to a movie, we get one of those little buckets of popcorn and we get one of those little drinks you know to wash it down the the movie theaters know that if you start eating popcorn because of the salt they put on it you're going to be thirsty that's why they sell so many you know soda popcorn combos but here jesus says you alone are the salt of the earth in other words as his followers we have a preserving influence in this rotting decaying putrefying world and we're also to be like an antiseptic to those who are hurting to those who are wounded we come alongside of them and we should also be enhancing the flavor of creating a thirst for jesus that's what salt does so as jesus goes on to say in this verse that if we are not exhibiting these qualities of salt then we're really just taking up space we're good for nothing except to be thrown out on the street trampled under the foot of men and that's what the world does with so many who are no longer salt for the lord we're seeing this more and more throughout the world today we see a lot of churches closing everywhere we're seeing denominations in trying to become woke and trying to be like the culture around them forsaking the th things of the gospel of jesus christ turning their back on the word of god and they're losing their flavor and the world just stomps on them we're seeing a record number of churches in america every year hundreds upon hundreds of churches close in america hundreds of pastors every month leave the ministry and so they're becoming more and more like the world, the culture around us. We're to be salt. We're to influence the culture, the world around us. We're not to let the world influence the church. Sadly, I don't know if it's sadly, but we're seeing a lot of churches crumble. Some need to because they've turned their back on the Word of God and on Jesus Christ. By the way, it's the Holy Spirit-filled church, the body of Christ, that is keeping the world from God's wrath and judgment at this present time. A time is soon coming when Jesus will take his bride, and if you missed the rapture Wednesday night, we're going to be looking at the great tribulation that comes after the rapture this coming Wednesday night. But a time is soon coming when jesus comes for his bride he takes us out of here and that's going to bring on the antichrist once we're removed then the antichrist shows up and that's when the great tribulation will begin when he signs a peace treaty with israel to rebuild the temple we'll get more into that on wednesday night but the great tribulation is the time of unparalleled judgment where god pours out his wrath on a christ rejecting world it's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Look at these verses. It says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, so he in capital letters, the Holy Spirit is now restraining wickedness from totally taking over. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So when the Holy Spirit is removed, well, the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, but he removes his restraining influence of sin when we're taken out because it's a holy spirit filled church that is being used by the lord today to help restrain sin from totally taking over and then once we're taken out of the way then the lawless one the antichrist will be revealed whom the lord will consume now jumps to the second coming of christ whom the lord will consume with the bright uh, breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming and so it's the Holy Spirit-filled church that is the hindering power that is holding back the Antichrist and total wrath and judgment from God at this present time. But once the Holy Spirit is removed and the church is gone, then the Lord will allow the Antichrist to be revealed and then he'll fulfill his evil plans and purposes so yes we are the salt the only salt in the world today verse 14 
You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, again, this is in the emphatic. Jesus is saying, you alone are the light of the world. The unbelievers are not the light of the world, but we, the disciples of Jesus Christ, are the only genuine light in the world of darkness. And just as salt has various functions, just as salt has various qualities, so does light. Light illuminates things that are hidden. Light shines and expels the darkness. Light helps people navigate when they're on the ocean or in a lake. Light will often bring in warmth. Those are a few of the physical things that light does. But there's also spiritual light. And the Bible talks a lot about spiritual light, that we are to be sons and daughters of light. But people are either walking in the light of Jesus or they are still in spiritual darkness. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 is where the Apostle Paul speaks of those who are perishing, who are dying in their sins without Jesus. Paul writes, "...whose minds the God of this age has blinded." So that's speaking of the Antichrist, or Satan, I should say. He's the God of this world. "...who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them." Now sometimes we hear people say, "Well, I..." saw the light, or when I heard the gospel of Jesus, the light bulb came on and I realized who Jesus is, that I'm a new creation in Christ. He saved me. He died for me. That's not a physical light, but that's a spiritual light. Not every spiritual light is good. Sometimes there's spiritual lights that are very bad. And we know this very clearly from the scriptures. Almost every book written by someone in the New Age movement refers to spiritual light. You need to come to the light, bathe in the light, and all these things they talk about enlightenment. Don't forget what Paul says about Satan and his followers. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 and 14. Paul says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. And so how do we know what is true light from Jesus and lying light, you might say, from Satan? Lucifer. Remember what Lucifer means? The shining one. It means the day star. That's Lucifer. He's bright. How do we know the difference? It comes back to the Word of God. It always needs to come back to what does the Word of God say? This is the final authority on what is right and wrong. Psalm 119, 105. Many of you know this verse. Your Word, speaking to the Lord, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And it always comes back to the truth, the authority of the Word of God. Now, in the context of what Jesus says in verse 14, that we are the light of the world, it's all based on the fact that Jesus Christ Himself is the ultimate light. He is the true light. We're just reflectors. He shines the light, and we're, we're to be living our lives in such a way that He reflects off of us, and His light will come out of our lives, because we don't generate any light ourselves, but we receive the light that Jesus is and has for us. This is what Jesus says in John 8, verse 12. Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And so again, it's Jesus living within us that causes us to shine brightly for God in this dark world. And as Jesus says here in Matthew 5, we are not to hide the light under a basket or, or, or put it under a you know, a, a dome, so to speak, but you're to put it on the lampstand. Why? Because when you come into a room and the light's on, then everybody can see what's going on in the room. You don't cover it with a basket and hide the light. That's the key to what Jesus says here in verse 16. Notice again, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. 
In other words, there's a right way to shine the light of Jesus, and there's a wrong way to shine the light. The right way is when Jesus gets all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. The wrong way is when people give you the glory and the honor and the praise. So everything we do should be about honoring the Lord, pleasing God, giving the praise and glory to Jesus. That's what it looks like to be, as he said earlier, poor in spirit, to be meek, to be pure in heart. The opposite of that is to be boastful and arrogant and prideful, as if all of our works were self-generated, self-motivated. No! By the way, this is the first time Jesus refers to God as our Father. Seventeen times in the Sermon on the Mount, He'll refer to God as our Father. That's more than in the entire Old Testament combined. So this is a whole new concept for the Jewish people that Jesus is speaking to here. He's introducing these Jews to a whole new way to relate to our Father in heaven. This was foreign to them. And as we'll see later on, this is one of the reasons why the religious leaders came against Jesus so strongly. Because he was talking about our Father in heaven. How You can't know God. You can't understand Him. And yet, God wants to have a relationship with His sons and daughters. But the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they wanted to control how the people looked at God. And so they would picture God as stern, as judgmental, as hateful, as distant. A God that was only for the self-righteous people. And, and again, the, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, Sadducees, they set themselves up as being the only one that could have a relationship with God, but it was based on their self-righteousness. The whole Sermon on the Mount will deal with Jesus shooting down their legalistic approach to God. By the way, when it comes to us being salt and light, uh, I love Psalm 34, verse 8. It says, Oh, taste and see. Salt, light. Taste the salt, see the light that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. In other words, as people around us taste the salt, they see the light of Jesus, the result should be, wow, the Lord is good. Look at what He's doing in your life. I want what you have. So often Christians are so hypocritical that the world looks at us and goes, I don't want what you got. I'm already messed up, and you're messed up more than I am. And so we need to live our lives in such a way that people see more of Jesus and less of us. And if that person will put their faith and trust in Christ alone for salvation, then they will experience true and genuine blessings from God. Well, look at verse 17. Jesus says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, this is a very, very important verse on a number of levels. Why do you think Jesus said this? Well, one of the biggest reasons is the Pharisees and the scribes will constantly accuse Jesus of breaking the law. Folks, Jesus knows the law better than anybody. He and the Holy Spirit and the Father wrote the Bible. So he knows the law inside and out. But the Jews accuse him of breaking the law. But Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Now, when we study the law of God, it becomes very clear pretty quickly that nobody, none of us can keep the law 100% of the time. And we're going to see that's what Jesus is going to say. This is the standard of perfection. You got to keep the law 100% of the time if you're going to try to save yourself. He'll even say at the end of this chapter, chapter 5, verse 48, you must be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. When he said that, the Jews' draw, jaw dropped to the floor. They're like, there's no way. We can never become perfect, and that's the point. Psalm 19 says, the law of the Lord is perfect. And it doesn't real, you know, take very long to realize that imperfect people can never keep God's perfect law. James will go on to say, if you stumble in one point of the law, one little part of the law, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. 
So there's nobody that says, well, I'm going to earn my way to heaven. I'm going to keep the Ten Commandments, and God's got to let me in. It's impossible. But this has been one of the biggest misconceptions concerning God's law, that somehow, some way, if we just try our best, we can earn our righteousness. We can become righteous enough for God to let us into heaven. But this is why Jesus Christ himself, God in the flesh, he had to come from heaven to earth. He had to fulfill, as he says here, all the law and all the prophets. As I've mentioned many times over the years, Jesus fulfilled about 300 prophecies when he came his first time. You know, the prophets spoke about how he would be born through a virgin, where he would be born, in Bethlehem. It tells us that he alone would live a perfect life. And his ministry, Old Testament prophets, that his ministry would include healing the sick, casting out demons, opening blind eyes, raising people from the dead. The prophet said how he would die. 700 years before crucifixion was invented, the prophet said Jesus would be crucified. Psalm 22. They told us why he would die for the sins of the world. Those prophets said he would be buried for three days. He'd rise up from the dead. So he fulfilled the prophets. But again, he says, I came to fulfill all the law as well. He fulfilled every aspect of God's law. He alone fulfilled every requirement for righteousness. And Jesus also fulfilled every daily, weekly, yearly sacrifice. Remember, all the animals yearly had to be sacrificed. Jesus is the final, ultimate Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. When the people brought their little lambs to be offered as a sacrifice, the priests would examine the lamb, not the people, they were coming because they were sinful. But the lamb had to be without spot, without blemish. Well, Jesus is the only one that fulfilled that. He was perfect in every way. The lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So in every way possible, Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. And this is why I tell people who are struggling with this whole idea of God's law versus God's grace. I always say you have to read Galatians. The whole book of Galatians was written by the Apostle Paul, who was as legalistic as you could ever be before he got saved, and then how he came under God's grace, and he shows us why the law was given, the importance of the law. But it's not to make us righteous, but to show us how unrighteous we are. And then read the book of Romans, because Paul lays out the facts so clearly as to why the law was given. Jesus declares us righteous and holy and completely forgiven because He will give us His very own righteousness when we give our lives to Him. In other words, because Jesus fulfilled all the law, and now that we are in Christ, Jesus, listen, Jesus has fulfilled all the requirements of the law in us. I can't keep the law, but Jesus did, and now I'm in Christ, so all the law has been fulfilled in me. How awesome is that? And so where we failed, Jesus prevailed. Where we failed to keep the law and live up to its perfect standards, Jesus prevailed in every aspect of the law on our behalf. So why was the law given? A lot of Christians today are still confused. Why was the law given? The law was given to show us how unrighteous we are, that we cannot live up to God's perfect standard. That's why we need Jesus. The law points us to the Savior. So we read, look at, look at these verses, Romans 3, verse 20. If you're taking notes, write down Romans 3, 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, by trying to keep, work the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Notice, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. How do I know what's, what is sin and what's not sin? How do I know what's right and not right? It's through the law, God's word. It shows us what sin is. Paul then says in Galatians 2.16, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ 
and not by the works of the law. Notice, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. In other words, nobody can become righteous by trying their hardest to live by the Ten Commandments. Give it up. You can't do it. It's impossible. 1 Timothy 1.8, Paul says, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. What's the right way to use the law? To allow it to do what it does best. To prove to us, you're a sinner. You need a Savior. That's the right way to use the law. There's no one righteous, no, not one. It's impossible for anyone to save themselves by trying to keep the law. But Paul tells us this. This is the key to me to understanding why the law is so important today. Galatians 3, 23. But before faith came, we were kept under guard. You were under lock and key. Kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor, our instructor, to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So the law, again, it's perfect. And it takes us by the hand, and it takes us to Jesus and says, He's the one you need. He's the Savior. The law could just show us, you're a sinner, Jeff. You cannot save yourself. But here's the one that did everything for your salvation. So the law is a, a tutor, an instructor to bring us to Christ. And we're justified by faith in Christ, not in ourselves trying to live up to God's perfect standard. Now, contrary to what some people wrongly believe, this does not mean that Christians are lawless. It doesn't mean you're no longer lawless. You can do whatever you want. Paul says, just because you're under grace... That you can just go around and say, well, I'm under grace. I can sin as much as I want. No, that's not true at all. The fact of the matter is the Holy Spirit has written the law upon our hearts. The Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to live out God's Word, to live out the commandments, not for salvation, but because we are saved. But just knowing that Jesus fulfilled all the law and all the prophets on our behalf, that takes all the pressure off of me trying to keep and obey the perfect law of God. Because every time I would try to do that, I would fail. And so have you. And then you get frustrated. And then you try to get, I promise God I'll try harder next time. And the next time you get busted, okay, God, I'll try harder next time. It doesn't, it, you can't win. But it takes all the pressure off of us when we just come to Jesus. I can't keep it. You can't keep it. Nobody can keep the law. This is why verses like Galatians 2.21 are so powerful, so important. Paul says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law. What's righteousness? It's being declared righteous. It's being justified. It's having a right standing before God. If righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. So by His grace, the law of God was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus as He became the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus going to the cross shows us we cannot save ourselves. Because if righteousness came through the law, just do this one thing, let alone ten things, then you could save yourself. There's no reason for Christ to come. But the reason Jesus came is to show us you cannot save yourself. It's impossible. He will save you when you put your faith and trust in Him alone. As the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Paul says these powerful words in 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, For He, referring to the Father, made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Jesus was perfect. He didn't know sin. He was sinless in every way. But he became sin for us. When? When he hung on the cross. Remember when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was at that moment that he was poured out the wrath of God upon Jesus. God was giving his wrath, his judgment for sin, our sin, upon Jesus. Jesus absorbed all of the pain, the punishment, the penalty for our sins upon himself. And so he who knew no sin he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. 
And so we become righteous when we simply put our faith and trust in the righteous one, Jesus. With that understanding of the importance and perfection of God's law, that makes the rest of these verses more understandable. Look at verse 18. Jesus says here, For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one or um, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, as long as this universe and our little planet are still around, not one jot, the word there is iota, or tittle, it's the smallest Hebrew yod, it's the smallest little mark in the Hebrew alphabet, not one of the smallest strokes will pass from the law until all is fulfilled. And so if anybody goes around saying, well, the law is worthless, or the Old Testament prophecies are useless, that person is in deep trouble with God, deep yogurt, deep doo-doo, I don't know. They're in trouble with God. But guess what? The entire universe will be vaporized after the millennial reign of Christ. This planet will also be vaporized after the millennial reign of Christ. Second. Peter 3, 10 to 14 says, Everything in the universe will be dissolved with fervent heat. Revelation 21, 1, John sees a new heaven and a new earth created out of nothing. He's going to make a whole new system. So, there are many Old Testament prophecies that speak of these things. Jesus still has 300 prophecies to fulfill in the future, and I fully believe that He will fulfill each and every one of them perfectly and precisely. And so we should never teach nor encourage anyone to throw out the Word of God nor the laws of God, but at the same time we need to have proper understanding. What does the Word of God say about the law and how to be saved? It's not by keeping the law, it's by trusting Jesus who alone kept the law. Only He kept it perfectly, and only He can give us salvation. So what Jesus says next is verse 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders in Israel, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And I'm sure as the multitudes are listening to this, when he says this verse, Again, they probably let out a collective groan. What? There's no way. Those guys are so righteous. They're so holy. And Jesus is saying our righteousness has to exceed their righteousness? We're toast. There's no way we can do that. Why do you think they thought that? Because the scribes and Pharisees had interpreted the law of God in such a way that only they could fulfill it. Only they could live up to their understanding of it. But the reality is Jesus is going to show the people that nobody, not even these religious leaders, could keep the law. So again, in chapter 548, he says, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. How do we know these religious leaders were not righteous? Because later on in chapter uh, 23, he's going to call them hypocrites. He's going to call them whitewashed tombs. He's going to call them sons of hell. These aren't compliments. He's going to say you're blind guides. In other words, they were not righteous before God. The only righteousness they had was self-righteousness. So the scribes and Pharisees, again, they were the most religious people in the world, and yet by no means were they going to enter the kingdom of heaven Religion is man trying to reach holy God. What God wants from us is a relationship where He comes from heaven to earth and establishes a relationship with you and me. The whole point of the Sermon on the Mount is for us to see our need for Jesus and the true righteousness that He can give us. So if you think you can make it into the kingdom of God on your own, well, then you have to be perfect. And I've never met a perfect person. I've met a few people that said they were perfect, 
And when I told them, you're not perfect, they got mad at me. I said, see, you just proved it. <laughs> you got anger in your heart. Jesus is going to say, if you got anger in your heart, you've committed murder. A lot of, and that's what he's going to go on to say. Over and over again, he'll say, you have heard it said, but I say to you. So he'll quote from the Ten Commandments. You've heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, even if you've had anger in your heart towards your brother without cause, you're guilty of murder. He's going to say, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you had lust in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. It always comes back to the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And that's Jesus' point, is getting to the heart, showing us your outward actions cannot save you. You need a new heart, and only Jesus can give us that new heart. All these Jews knew about Moses and how God had given them the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. But then out of the Ten Commandments came all these laws and ordinances concerning the sacrificial animals. That's primarily what the book of Leviticus deals with. Well, that should be enough to tell you right there. You cannot keep the Ten Commandments because all those sacrificial animals were to cover your sins because you couldn't keep the Ten Commandments. So God said, you got to have all these sacrifices because you still mess up the Ten Commandments. That should have been obvious to everybody. But over time, the Jewish religious leaders, they turned the Ten Commandments into 613 laws and commandments. 365 of those laws says, you shall not do this, you shall not do that. 248 of them said, you must do this and you must do that. And when it came to breaking the Fourth Commandment concerning the Sabbath, they came up with 40 ways you could break the Fourth Commandment. And then each of the, those 40 ways, they came up with 40 more ways for each of those 40 ways that you can break the commandment. And every time the Jews added to God's laws, they just made it that much harder to have a relationship with God. And so this is why Jesus came against all the heavy burdens that these scribes and Pharisees placed upon the people. This is why Jesus would say things like this. Look at this verse in Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. He said to them, The Sabbath was made for man. What does Sabbath mean? It means rest. The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Under the legalistic system of the Jewish leaders, there is no rest. It was just one burden after another burden. Again, this is exactly why Jesus tells the Jewish people, Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30, He says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. He's referring to the law. You're being burdened by and crushed by the law that these Sadducees and Pharisees are putting on you. He says, come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Literally, I'll give you Sabbath. It's found in Christ. He is our eternal rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest or Sabbath for your souls, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. And so what a huge contrast between the heavy burden of the law and the light burden of Jesus. Why is it light for us? Again, Jesus has taken all of the burden of the law upon himself. And think of it this way. Remember it says, cursed is everyone who hangs from a tree. So here's Jesus carrying the cross beam, this heavy cross beam, the wooden beam, up to Golgotha. It's like a picture of him carrying the burden of the law, and he dies. Cursed is the one who hangs in the tree as he's crucified on the cross for all of our sins. And it's only because Jesus kept every jot and every tittle of the law for us that he can impute to us his very own righteousness. What part do we play in salvation? Well, again, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. Jesus did it all, but this is what we read in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So that's the part we have is faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Again, what did we do? Nothing except believe. 
Put your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. In Romans 12, it says that God has given to each one of us a measure of faith. Everybody born into this world has a measure of faith. But where are you placing your faith? If you put your faith in Christ alone for your salvation, He'll save you. If you put your faith in your bank account, you put your faith in your keeping the Ten Commandments, everything will let you down. If you put your faith in our government, that's a mistake. You know, your faith for salvation has to be in Jesus Christ alone. And so in the rest of this chapter, Jesus will totally dismantle what these perceived religious righteous men were saying you could achieve on your own by your own good works, your own efforts. And again, over and over again, we'll hear Jesus say, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And they were going to hear the proper interpretation of God's laws. And when he's done, the people will quickly realize there's nobody that can keep the law of God. Nobody. If, you're, if your intention is to make yourself righteous, then you're misinterpreting the law. If you're seeing the law for what it's for, why it's good to show us that we're unrighteous, it's a tutor. It brings us to Jesus. That's a proper interpretation. And the law is good if you use it lawfully to bring us to the loving, saving arms of Jesus Christ. We'll close there. And... Um, Let's close in a word of prayer. Let's worship the Lord. If you need prayer, maybe you've been struggling with trying to be a good person. It's just not working out. Been there, done that. And it never works out. Just trying to do your best to be a good person. But when you yield your life over to Christ, you surrender your heart to Jesus, He'll do above and beyond anything that you could ever hope or imagine.